Welcome to the Unsecurity Podcast. Each week, Evan and Brad give an inside look at current information security news, breaches, best practices, and other things you should know to improve your information security. Here are your hosts, FR Secure's Evan Francine and Brad Nye. Hey, hey, it's time for episode 28 of the Unsecurity Podcast. I'm Evan Francine, your host this week. I'm going to try to get a little more excited because uh, it's hard sometimes on Monday morning, Brad. Yeah, yeah you can talk. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little, it does. And it's cold. It's early. It's yeah. like 30, 34 degrees I got up this morning. On the plus side, it was bright out. Yeah. All right. You're always, you're always a glass half full kind of guy. All right. Well, uh, did I already say my name? This is Evan Francine. That's me. I'm the host this week. I'm actually in town, so it's nice. It is. Uh, last week went pretty well. I thought it was nice to have Ryan here. Yeah, he was, he was. We had a good conversation. We actually ended up talking for about another half hour after we ended the the podcast. Did you really? just about stuff? Well, he he he's good at he he's a he's passionate. Yes, about his about his thing, and you figured out how to say his last name. Uh, Cla- Cla- yeah. Claudier. 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 He said, "Just not Claudier." <laughs> Claudier or Claudier. Cloutier. Go all French. <laughs> Funny. All right. All right. So uh <laughs> you could tell it's a little early. Well, yeah, man. This is how we roll. Uh so you saw the show notes? Yep. Okay. About you like you said, about five minutes before the show, maybe? Uh last night. Nice. Yeah, well yesterday evening. Yeah. So you prepare better than I do. How was your I, weekend? It was good. It's good. It was gross. Yeah. I built a closet. Nice. Yeah, just on a whim. I had I actually had Friday off, so I got. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. I did all the stuff that's been, uh, we'll say, neglected around the house okay. since April when we started the uh, mentor program. So it's, yeah, that's what so happened. I got to get. House. I was getting a little bit of grief about you know things not being done. Me too. My wife was. Uh, she said, "You know, I had a bunch of things to do around the house, and so." I said, well, we, we've always wanted to put a closet in Lydia's room. She's like, you can't do that. I'm like, just, thanks. It's just wood. Well, yeah. She, well, she's brutally honest with me. I know. It keeps you in check. I'm like, my wife and kids are the same. Right. So, like, every five minutes, after I'd made anything, any kind of progress on the, on the, on the closet, I'd brought her in <laughs> to show her, hey, what do you think? Words of affirmation is my love language, too. Mm. So, that helped. All right. Well, here we are. Uh, we survived a week that was. Last week was crazy for me. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't get to check with you, so I don't even know how your week was last uh, week. I, I'm, I don't really remember it. So, no. <laughs> it was good. It was. I had I had a good week. Um, it, obviously, we, you both, we both spoke at Secure360. So yeah, we fun. caught up a little bit there. You, that was fun. You had a much worse week than I did in terms of travel I and think, speaking. Oh, yeah. Because uh, you were what, out in Anaheim. Mm-hmm. Monday flew back. Yeah, spoke. Did you speak on Tuesday? No, no. Tuesday Tuesday, I didn't. Wednesday you had two speech or two two talks. talks, Yeah, and Thursday you had another one. Yeah, then a panel. Two on Thursday with a bunch of uh, post secondary uh, college um, faculty. It was one of their conferences. It was really cool. Yeah, and then maybe the two mentor program. So right, I, I the classes. Those, those classes. I, and, and like I said in my notes, I truly was in PowerPoint hell. Yeah. I was so happy that you, <laughs> <laughs> was it Wednesday. I was like, I woke up, I was like, oh no, we didn't do the, the slides. And, and then I saw your email, I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> well, when I'm down, I just on. figured I'd do it because I know we're all busy. You know, we don't get a chance to catch up as much as I'd like to during the week. So I don't know if you even have time, man. Yeah, I, I could have made time. Well, now you tell me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> Man, I did so many PowerPoints because he figured 100. It was about 110 slides Monday and Wednesday. So that's 220. <clears throat> then I had one. Yeah, I mean, it was 250, two, three, four hundred 400 slides maybe last week. Are you moving your yeah, microphone? There we go. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of slides. Yeah. Yeah, so security people do PowerPoint 
you know, if you're going to get into information security, uh, learn PowerPoint. Yeah. Unfortunate. I wish there was a better way. I try to do it with a minimal, like just the talking points yeah. on there uh, and then talk about it. Cause otherwise, you know, nobody wants to sit and listen to somebody read off a, a slide. I, <laughs> that is right. so painful. It's, I feel bad sometimes in the, the class because there is a lot of just, you're going to have to memorize this stuff. You have to understand what yeah. we have on here. That's the hard part. Now we're getting into more of the well, we're practical good. stuff. Like we're, well, yeah, well, actually Wednesday will be the last lecture. Yeah. And so for the so, people listening, uh, we're talking about the CISSP mentor program. That we started in first week, April like eighth, I think. Did we? Okay. And so we've been doing two classes at a week, pretty much. We had a couple of little break yep. sessions here and there. We have one coming up, like we won't teach on Monday because yeah. we have a holiday. Is it Memorial Day? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. Yeah. So tons of classes, and anybody who's done the CISSP before knows uh, the joy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a lot of memorization. I am a pro CISSP person because I like how it's so broad. Mm -hmm. So it sort of, even if you're a a pen tester, I think understanding, you know, where, what you're doing fits in the context of everything else is important. I agree. So there's a lot of people go, what's the point if we, uh, you know, some of the security models and Biba and Bella Padula and all that, but without knowing where that, Mm -hmm. where you came from. Right. What the history was behind it, you can't, it, it helps build that foundation. True. So. Yeah, there's some good theory stuff there, right? Yeah. Because the theory of those things still still applies, maybe not the model itself, you know? Right. Right. All right, so we survived the week. You had, uh, so we did catch up on, what day was Secure 360? Was that Wednesday? Wednesday? Yeah. We yeah. got to talk a little bit. We did. At, that day. That was fun. The, what is it? Yeah, at the conference. Mm-hmm. It was nice. We had most of the sales staff was out Tuesday and Wednesday. Oh, at conferences? For conferences or travel. So Tuesday, I uh, I, I had all day with no sales oh, stuff, basically. Nice. I got so much done. Yeah, Tuesday, I worked from it was home. nuts. My flight got in Tuesday early morning. I was probably home by 2 a.m. Because, you know, you flew in from the West Coast. Uh, so I just work from home on yeah. Tuesday. Yeah. And then I, I, what, what day was Thursday? This is security life, man. I'm trying to remember <laughs> what day I did what, what Thursday. Yeah. Thursday I was up really late. So I slept in on Friday too, yeah. but I worked. Yeah. Crazy week. And we're going to talk about that. So that was part of what I wanted to talk about in this present, in this podcast was just our week. We had five talks and I, and I say we, because you know, it was, you knew the talks I gave, you know what I mean? I shared them with you and we were at uh, five talks, four conferences, two classes and a panel. So that was a busy week. Um, this week isn't quite as busy. I'll be in Denver, um, Wednesday or Thursday. I can't remember yet. Well, because I haven't looked at my schedule. If you look too far ahead, then you just get crunched. I look the night before when yeah. I go to bed. I'm like, okay, what do I have tomorrow? And then I never remember. So I look when I get up and I'm like, yeah. all right, do I have any client facing me? Nope. Okay. I can wear a t-shirt. I don't have to dress right. up. Yeah, I do that too. <laughs> so Wednesday, I think it's Wednesday or Thursday, um, Denver ISSA. I'll be at the ISSA meeting, we're doing a three-hour incident response workshop. Mm. So that'll be fun. That'd be good. Yeah. Um, so if you're in Denver and you you know, want to come say hi, you should do it. You should see me at the ISSA and we can hang out or something. Yeah. I fly fun. in and fly out that same day. I'll have to give you our uh, new IR plan oh, yeah. template there. For there, sure. So you can kind of look through what we've put together. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I know you and... Oscar been putting together a lot of IR stuff. Yeah, and uh, Megan actually put a lot of work into, you know, cleaning up the document and mm-hmm. making it you know, a little more maybe fun- business friendly, I guess. Yeah. Business functional. Megan's pretty awesome. All right. So last week, let's talk about it. Uh, I gave four talks. Let's talk. Let's start with your talk. You gave a talk on Wednesday at uh, Secure360 and... 
Tell us what, tell us what you so talked about. It was DR doesn't have to be debilitating. Well, yeah, it does. So, no, I'm just kidding. Totally. <laughs> totally but kidding. It was interesting. So they, they had a lot of talks around uh, BCP, DR, you know, business continuity, disaster recovery. Oh, at Secure360? 360, at Secure360. And uh, <clears throat> mine wasn't, you know, it wasn't a technical talk. It was, yeah, here's what should be in the plan towards the end of it. And just talking through and like, you know, hey, who who has all these parts and, mm. you know, who has a DR plan? Uh, and then hands down, if you're, when you see something you don't have in yours. And so when, a, you, when you asked how many people had a DR plan, what percentage of people raised their hand? Mm, probably most of them did actually. Because you had like what, 50-ish yeah, people? 40, 40, 45, okay. 50, somewhere in there. Um, most, of well, most of them did, but then you start, all right, okay, so does it have all these things? And How many of them have been updated in the last? Well, yeah, <laughs> that was the other part of it. Oh. And, uh, but yeah, a lot of them went down when it was, I think a lot of people have a DR plan that's just the IT procedure piece. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have the call tree. It doesn't have all mm-hmm. these other pieces that are so, you know, critical to business contacts, the, all that stuff. But, so why do you think that is? is it, do you think... They miss that higher level stuff because they didn't have executive buy-in yeah, or just, I just driven just, from an IT person. It's just, yeah, IT's task with doing it. And so what does IT do? Well, what, here's the things I need to do. If they go down, here's how I uh-huh. recover. Okay. I think that's more. Do you see IT doing, uh, you know, cause we talked about that too last week, which yep. was, was coincidental, I yeah. suppose. Cause it was Wednesday, Wednesday you were talking and then Wednesday night we talked about it. In talked class. about yeah. So you know, you know the right way to do it is to do that business impact analysis, build out yeah. that recovery time objective, recovery point objective, and all that stuff. Nobody doesn't seem like many people actually go through that hard work. No, and so a lot of what my uh, talk about was how do we make, how do you get that buy-in from the business? So it was about communication. Okay. All right. So instead of RTO, RPO. MTD, all uh, you know, all those acronyms that IT and security love. It's okay. Translate that to say, you know, what? How much? How much data could we lose? What is? What is? If this goes down and we're down for how long before you have a you feel the pain? Mm-hmm. And then how long is it going to take you to come back up from it? You know. So if I get it back up, how much work is involved for? Right. You? for the business unit to understand, you know, and helping them understand that. So it's that communication piece and, and understanding that, you know, in it, it's, it's intimidating mm-hmm. to the business because well, you know, what, what's intimidating to people, right. what they don't understand how many, and I, I, you know, because I'm a bit of a smart ass, I think we can say that we can, it's our podcast. All right. Uh, I'm going to, I'm a little sarcastic. I'm going to reiterate that he said smart ass. Yes. Okay. Okay. For the record. Uh, <laughs> for the record. But uh, yeah, I was like, all right, so how many C levels do we have here? And just so I know, and they raise their hand. I'm like, okay, so I know who to avoid the rest of the conference. C <laughs> levels are intimidated by technology. I usually ask that. I go, how many lawyers? Yeah. yeah. How many lawyers? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was like, we have to dumb it down for, for the C levels, for the executives, because they don't understand it. That's not their job. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like how many people do you have? How many executives do you know that have trouble right. with their phone? Well, how do you think they're going to think about when you talk about you know VTLs or virtual tape libraries or backup to disk to disk and right. replication and all that stuff? It's intimidating. Yeah. So you have to be the ones to make that that when I think effort, IT people in general, because you know. You and I sort of started there ourselves, right? I think a lot of security people do. Um, we don't, I don't, I'm just thinking of my own experience. I didn't get out enough yeah, and talk to people enough when I was in IT. I don't think you, anybody really does, you know, because I don't think there is no, any such thing as enough. I mean. Yeah, that's true. I think. So when you do a business impact analysis, well, that means I have to get out of my desk, go talk to people, educate people. Mm-hmm. A lot of people aren't was, good at that. Yeah, I always tried to do. I tried. Do that. I yeah. enjoy talking to the to people. So, I, but yeah, I definitely when I started for sure it was just like do whatever you got to do. Right. I can think back to some jobs where it was just like 
doing what's right because yeah. you know you're the only person for uh, so handling the. So I wonder if that's one of the reasons why if an, if a if a DRP is driven so much from IT without really the the rest of the business involvement, and just in general, IT people are desk people Mm -hmm. you know they don't get out much and talk to other other tribes within the organization much the combination of those things might be a reason why their drps aren't as good as they should be oh yeah i would agree i think that's a big big part of it yeah right so but you know it's it's all about changing that mindset though it should be the custodian you shouldn't be the ones making that risk decision amen now you can you're gonna have to help the business understand you know what they should be doing and translate what they say into, oh, okay, you can be down for 15 minutes that here's what it's going to cost. Right. Oh, okay. Four, four hours. Okay. That's, that's okay. We can do that then. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Cause I've, I like simple, you know, that, um, and I've always thought that as a CISO, I have two jobs. One is to give you know, executive management, the best possible risk data I can to help them make good risk decisions. Mm-hmm. Right. So in that is a lot of coaching, a lot of teaching. Yeah. That's one job. And then the second job is for me to enable, I'm sorry, enact those risk decisions yeah. to the best of my ability. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to do a lot of coaching. Yep. But I think <clears throat> to your point too, you know, we started out that way, but I think both of us are a lot different now. I do a lot more coaching than I do anything else. I think. Oh yeah. I think, and, and I'm looking back to, you know, the progression of the career and, you know, the first couple of, you know, sys admin type jobs that I had, it was so focused on just the, the technical stuff. And, but I think that's kind of a natural thing. And then as the career progressed, getting to, okay, business i need help with from you on this and right. you know getting out and i've never had an issue getting in front of executives or leadership so mm-hmm. i was was the one from it you know right. I, i'm i don't care if they need their computer fixed okay i'll go do it the help desk guys don't want right. to deal with them that's fine i'll get facetime with them it's it, it can't be bad right to, well, i think to one of that, that I think one of the best things you can do for career progression too, you know, just in maturing in your career is to learn people skills. Mm -hmm. You know, the better you get at people skills, the better you'll move up. Right. Well, and, and exactly. And, and learning the business too, right. That was one of the slides was, you know, communicate this to the business, show them how you're thinking rather than be it or security being a cost center. All right. If we have Mm -hmm. each outage is, whatever, 30 man hours. And so that's $3,000 per outage or whatever it is. Right. Well, if we implement this new technology for 15,000 and then it reduces our outage to five hours. Right. Well, now we can show that. And then even if it's not perfect, if you you can show you're thinking that way, mm-hmm. the businesses go, Oh, well, ooh, he's, he's, and talking I've almost, our language. And I've almost purposely thrown in crappy math into some of those things to get their attention and get their engagement. Yeah. Because they're like, no, there's no way you could, you know, it could be that worthwhile. Well, let's oh. talk about it. And then you start having this discussion mm-hmm. and they're like, see, I showed you your math is off. But then they're still but, positive there. Right. Isn't it? <laughs> right. So, you know, I got my, I got what I was looking for. That's I needed a, that little bit of shock value of a faulty math on purpose. Sometimes I've done that. Yeah, yeah, it's, and you know, it's an estimate. I can't do it without the business. I'm, I'm taking some assumptions here. Yep. All right, help me figure out what what should we be looking at so I can do it correctly. Exactly. So, well, in your in your talk, um, pretty well received. I think so. Yeah, I had okay. a couple of people, multiple people. Did they clap? Uh, nobody walked out. Okay. Nobody booed. That's a win. Nobody threw anything. If you're talking about DRP. Right? No, they clapped. Um, okay. Because I've learned how to to end my presentations now. <laughs> so you kind of like, well, thank you very much. You know? And then you kind of leave this like pause and then they clap. Because yeah. then you, then it almost makes them feel un- awkward if they don't clap. Yeah. I had a couple actually good questions at the end of it too, which I, was I which is the, nice. I did too. You know, I'm a, we'll get to my talk in a little bit because- 
Yeah, there were some really interesting things. I actually did the talks that I did on Wednesday and Thursday on purpose to see what I could learn, not so much what I could teach. Because mm. uh, I talked about things I'd never talked about, and I just wanted to kind of see what the reaction would be. Because on Wednesday, I had my first talk was with really IT ish type people, not security people. Right. And then I gave that same talk in the afternoon to security people. Okay. And so I did that on purpose because I wanted to see the different reactions from both. Uh, but it was, it was really, really cool. But that, the, the afternoon talk was weird because it was like four o'clock in the afternoon and the yeah. conference ended yeah. at five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was, yeah, the second day of at <laughs> Yeah. It was weird. It's a long. So what, what takeaways, uh, if you had like one takeaway, one thing you could tell the audience about disaster recovery planning, what would it be? If you can think of one thing, like maybe in your presentation, you were trying to just drive home this point. And you, you got to get the to be successful. You have to get the business engaged. Amen. Just, I couldn't agree more with that. All right. So now this is where I hog up yeah. some of the talk, <laughs> some of the yeah, podcast. I, was, I looked at it and I, I appreciate you saying we had all these. I had one. <laughs> Well, you did all the talking. But it's teamwork the, makes a dream work. Man. I did the classes. I, I always feel like every time I'm giving a talk that just as much as I'm representing, you know, whatever point I'm trying to drive is representing, you know, the, the company. Right. Um, so, yeah, the week started off with uh, um, I was out at uh, Anaheim for the uh, North America, 2019 North America ISACA CACS event. I don't know what CACS stands for. I never even looked it up. To be honest, do you something about auditing? I'm guessing the A has got to be audit. S is maybe super, super sexy. I mean, audit the auditing is sexy, right? Anyway, the no. so I, no, so I started the present. So I started off. I kind of opened the conference. I was the first talk of everything, and I was in this innovation center, uh, which was basically just a stage with a wide open area in the middle of all the vendors. Right. You know? And so I, I thought I was talking at 7 a.m. And uh, so I'm, you know, kind of walking by and I'm like, man, there ain't nobody in this innovation area. Right. It's just <laughs> nobody. So I went to my, my wife was with me. I went to my wife and I went to uh, a couple of guys that are, were with us in our booth. I'm like, man, I don't think I'm going to talk. Because there's nobody here. I'd be standing up on the stage by myself preaching <laughs> to what? Imaginary friends? It's like a normal day at work. I know. <laughs> so I'm like, this is just weird. So I was wrong. It didn't start at 7. It actually started at 7.20. Uh, it's like 7.05. The, the One of the event organizer type people comes, you know, and there you are, you know. Are you ready to go? And I'm like, well, you know, I don't think I'm, I don't, I'm not thinking I'm going to talk because there's like nobody there. She goes, what are you talking about? Come over here. So I went and, and you know, it's kind of around the corner and I look and it's like packed now. I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> all right, let's do it. So, uh, so you start off Monday morning, beginning of the conference. And my topic is the title is different than the topic. The topic is third party information security risk management. Ooh. I was gonna say we don't have the most exciting topics to yeah. talk about. I, I get I get jazzed about it, but yeah, people, people, I don't know. They they it was they're actually very engaged. Uh, the title of the presentation was why, and I just went through. You know, I love that book by Simon Sinek. If you haven't read that mm -hmm. book, please read it. It's just it, I love yeah, it. Yeah, it it put so many things like it, they just clicked. Right, it's like oh. Yeah. That's why I've been doing things the way I've done them. Right. Like it just, it made, yeah, put that puzzle together. Absolutely. It's not a, you know, it's not a security book. It's a, it's a kind of it's an a, everything it's book. It's like a, yeah, a little bit of like a self-help type of yeah. like, here's why you're, why you're doing the things you're doing. Right. Totally. So I, uh, so the presentation was why, you know, why third party information, security risk management and you know, so what's the purpose? You know, for some people, the purpose for third-party information security risk management is defensibility. Right. They want to be defensible if a bad thing happens. Some people actually want to do it right. So it's truly about risk management. Mm -hmm. Some people 
understand how you can't separate third-party information security from enterprise information security. They are integrated pieces. So it was, you know, and this was a 20-minute talk. It was, let's define the why together. Um, This is what generally it is. This is what it should be. So, and I use logic in this talk, which I love, you know, you know me, I love logic. So I said, uh, so I basically walked through, this is what information security is. This is what third party information security is. This is how they fit together and you can't separate them. Right. So you can't say you, you take information security seriously at, at the end of the logic. You can't say that you take information security seriously if you don't take third party information security seriously. Yeah. That's a good point. So it was a good talk and and the the feedback at the end of it was good. You know, people, I didn't get, I didn't get booed either. I think they, I think they clapped. I don't remember. Um, but it was good. So I I did look it up. It's computer audit control and security. Computer audit and control. Really? There you go. So that's what I did. Computer audit and, and controlling. So the talk went well, and then uh, you know after that we uh, there was a book signing at our booth, which was awesome. We we have uh, we only brought 150 books, and they were all gone. But I wow. met I had two two questions that I asked everybody who came to our booth for a book signing was, where are you from, and what do you do? And uh, met people from Nigeria, Portugal, Belgium, Netherlands. Germany, Spain, Colombia. Wow. I mean, yeah. all, yes, all over. It was so cool, and uh, and that was the whole point. The whole point of the book wasn't to sell books. It, the whole point of the book is to spread the word. Right. So when you think like somebody in Nigeria might actually <laughs> read this thing, are you kidding me? That's beautiful. I love it. So that's why our marketing group is so. <laughs> you like he's just giving them away. I know, right? That's what I do. I give stuff away. Uh, all right. So that was the talk on that was Monday, Monday. Yeah. Then flew back and then, uh, two talks on, uh, Wednesday and both the, both of them are the same talk. It was, uh, the first one was at Loeffler tech fest, which was at, uh, St. Paul river center. Mm-hmm. Um, good venue. That's a good venue. And, and, and there were a lot of people there. I would say there was probably 1500 people. Oh, well, maybe that's good. Um, yeah, maybe, yeah, probably maybe even more because PJ Fleck, the uh golden gopher mm. football oh, yeah. coach, was right. the <laughs> was the uh keynote and I stole his badge. That's always fun. Well, because somebody said I couldn't do it, and I was like, <laughs> right? just like my wife said, I couldn't build a, a closet, a closet. Seriously, come on. <laughs> so, yeah, and all I did was just went up to the desk and said. Somebody says, somebody thinks that I can't get this badge basically or something like that. So can I just take it and show them that I can actually get it? They're like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> they just use brutal honesty. And then, uh, yeah, I brought it back though. Nobody, I mean, I can, I was, I'm not going to pass myself off as PJ no, Fleck. No. I'm heavier, um, uglier, mm. more facial hair. So whatever. <laughs> It was fun. Uh, so speak this one. So this talk in at Loeffler was speaking information security. And the point here, which do, it doesn't sound like a sexy topic, but I really enjoyed giving this talk because this gave me the ability to really preach what our mission is mm-hmm. and preach it pure. Yeah. I enjoyed that. So uh, what did I talk about? I talked about, okay. So I just started with um, same thing I've talked about a million times. Information security is. Yeah. Is what? And it's interesting how, yeah, you get, nobody wants to raise their hand. You know, I was, I did this, right. I gave the same talk at Secure 360, which was all security people. And nobody, nobody raised their hand. I'm like, or nobody said, you know, when I said information security is what? See, I, if I were in the audience and nobody raised their hand, I'd give some sort of a, what totally the, wrong answer just to like try and throw you off because right. that's, that's who I am. Or just give me a, yeah, or just give me a smart ass <laughs> answer. Right. Yeah, I'll take anything. So, you know, I walked through, you know, information security is managing risk. Oh, you know, I was going to say it, it's 
protecting against cyber threats only. Well, yeah. Only. Yeah. Only cyber. cyber. Only, only cyber. Cyber, cyber, yeah. cyber, cyber, cyber. Yes. Cyber cells. Cyber cells. Cyber, cyber sexy cells. Cyber cells sexy. Yeah. <laughs> See? Threw you off. No, I know. <laughs> yeah, I love I love that. I love when people use cyber to use on something <laughs> it's not really supposed to be used with. Uh, so information security. So I walk through, you know, it's managing risk, not eliminating risk. It's not compliance. And then managing risk and what? That's another one of those words that's just so overused and it's frustrating because if you and I are going to work on something together, we should have an understanding of what it is we're working on. Yeah. And so when I ask what information security is and people just blankly stare at you, right? maybe they have a definition, but they're not, they're afraid to, they're afraid to say it, but you know, they're not afraid to say other stuff. Right. You know, I mean, during the talk, I'll ask other questions and they'll, they'll pipe in for that. Hmm. But yeah, and it's so weird because it's like it's like what we do, right? Right. It's, I mean, it, it can't get easier than that. What would you say you do here? Right. Right. <laughs> Nobody answers. So we walk through the talk about you know information security, managing risk, and then you know the types of controls and what's risk and you know likelihood and impact. You know, and it's funny because I ask the same thing about risk because it's such an overused term. And I'll say, you know, what is risk? And again, nobody will. Somebody sometimes... It's a board game. They do. I have heard that yeah. before. Not Maybe it did last Wednesday. But somebody... you They, they get closer on this. Because one said probability. Hmm. And I was like, yes. I think, uh, that, I think that's close. And... <laughs> and then somebody else... Well, doesn't it have to take into account like... Uh, like how bad it is? I go, you mean like impact? They're like, yeah. And I'm like, there we go. There you go. There's your definition. Yeah. But then it, I think that's too high level to apply. Like, le just likelihood and impact. What does that actually mean? Yeah. yeah. You know, how do I do that? Yeah. And when you were saying that, I think, oh, I, I had a good point. Um, shoot. I don't remember what I was going to say. Likelihood, impact, risk, board game, impact. Yeah. I, well, I think, I think. It goes to that we we don't we we make it too complicated a lot of times, right? Mm -hmm. we, you just keep it simple. It's not, yeah, it's not over overthinking it, right? I think that's a very True. common thing. You get a lot of people that in this industry that are typically very analytical, look, you know, and they overthink. Mm -hmm. No, it, this is all it is. Right, you don't have to make it more complicated than it than it really is. That's very true. That, and I think that we just take stuff for granted. Yeah, we just take you know. Well, everybody knows what information security is, but do they? Oh, no. nobody here had a definition. <laughs> right, I asked, and you guys all sat there. Well, and so, uh, but you bring up a good point about the the overthinking because that's one of the things I've heard before is. Um, you know, when I, when I'll, when I'll, I'll give a talk that they're like, yeah, but that's so basic. And I'm like, yeah, no, but you're not doing do, it, but you're not doing it. I understand it's basic, but why would I go to these complicated things if I don't right. understand the basics, if I don't have that foundation? I know I've done that. It, and it's like, you get just almost like that paralysis by analysis. Yeah. And then it's like, wait a minute, what am what am I doing? Right. What was the first thing I came up with? Oh, yeah, no, that's probably what I should do. It's <laughs> just start with a fundamental and that right. it doesn't have to be. Right, because you could take any one of these, right? So when I go from likelihood and impact, I always start with, because likelihood and impact are functions of vulnerabilities and threats, right? Mm -hmm. That's where I can apply it. Right. So what you know vulnerabilities are just weaknesses and right. i always start with vulnerabilities versus threats because i understand myself better than anybody else hopefully hopefully exactly well yeah you got to get honest right right and sometimes people don't like to get honest either they don't like to call yeah you know, look in the mirror <laughs> I, I know all my vulnerabilities i have no asset management program yeah exactly <laughs> exactly so you take you know so vulnerabilities in what you know administrative physical and technical controls and so on the base, you know, you can take the basics of administrative controls, right? 
governance, policy, risk management function, uh, background checks, asset management, you know, on and on. These are the basics of administrative controls. But if you want to get deep mm -hmm. and get complicated, you know, and get more sophisticated, you certainly can do that. But why uh -huh. would I talk about individual procedural things or psychology in my training and awareness program if I don't have a training and awareness program? If I don't have a policy. Right. Right. So you do have to start with that foundation and then build on it because you can get, because I, I think the most uh, uh, intriguing part of information security for me is administrative stuff. It's the people part because the technical right. controls aren't that hard. No. It's on and off ones and zeros. Right. Whitelist They're, over blacklist. You know I mean, it's configured or it's not. Right. It's days. Right. In theory. As long as people aren't as playing people with aren't it. messing with it, it won't change. But it's that people part, man. I was talking to somebody. They were. They said that they were. Uh, they wanted to get into security, and I was like, "Oh, no!" It was Skylar, mm. and uh, he's like, "Yeah, you know, I got a degree in psychology." I'm like, "Bro, bring that into security." Yeah. Because oh have, yeah, we have a lot of need still for figuring out the psychology of security. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's a lot of groundbreaking research, but that's that's the key. Yeah. And and yeah, if you understand how people work, it makes your mm -hmm. it it, op it opens up a lot of opportunity for big time. You know, improving things. Big time. So start with vulnerabilities and then you apply threats and where do you get threats? I mean, you can get that anywhere. There's all kinds of threat feeds because I think people also generally don't like to look at themselves in the mirror critically. Yeah. So, because you see a lot of organizations that are subscribing to threat feeds, they understand, you know, some things about threats, yet their controls are crap. Right. Why don't you start with vulnerabilities? Why don't you start with your controls first and then apply the threats to those things? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I know all my threats, but I don't know where they apply. Is, right. Yeah. And so you see, you also see a lot of, you know, you've seen a number of assessments over the years and so have I. Um, and usually they're not risk assessments because they'll use things like the capability maturity model, mm -hmm. right, which is a one to five scale. Right. Um, which is really a capability maturity model really only applies to vulnerabilities, the effectiveness of the control. It right. doesn't take into account the threat piece. So then it can't be risk. No. Just by the definition. And I'm literal on this stuff because we have oh, to be. You have to. Yeah. And that's what the, the whole point of the talk was, really, was the language of information security. So I talked through that. And then, so you come up with this definition. This is what information security is. And everybody's nodding their heads. Mm -hmm. Now, it's pretty easy on the people that aren't in my tribe, meaning the IT folks at Loeffler Tech, at the Tech Fest. Okay. I'm like, all right, you know, we're feeling it now. At the Secure360, it was a different vibe. It was like... You guys are all nodding your heads in agreement. Where were you when I asked this question at the beginning? Yeah. Because I Nobody get that. Nobody said anything. <laughs> now you're saying, yeah, that's right. Well, because I get that all the t I get that a lot. I get the, the head nodding and it's like, well, then do it. Yeah. Like if you talk about asset management and how important it is to the information security program, everybody's nodding their heads. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Let's go. How many of you then have a good, solid asset management program? And all the hands go down. Yeah. Why? Why the disconnect? You all agree that this is critical to your information security program, yet you're not doing it. Right. And there's all kinds of reasons. Well, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's it's dirty work. Yeah, you know, it's... There's not a lot of blinky lights there. No. There are some tools now that you can go out and buy that are blinky lights if you use them right. Right. That you can get a pretty good asset inventory, at least to start. So anyway, uh, so... I, I used that definition then for our tribe, and then I correlated that to what about people that aren't in our tribe? So that if we agree that this is our language for information security in our industry, meaning amongst us security people, you see, because I can have a discussion like this with you. I can have a 30-minute discussion about what is this. Right. I don't get that same opportunity with the executives. I don't get no. the same opportunity yeah. with the board of directors. You might get five minutes. I, that's what I always shoot a shot for, five minutes. If I can do this in five minutes, man, I win. I think – Don't even, fight me back. Even more important than the five minutes is that, that first 30 seconds. 
Right. Right. If you go in super technical or whatever, they tune you out immediately. Yeah. You so, start seeing them pick up their phones or. Yeah. You got to get that. Right. That initial 30 seconds is critical. And then you've got maybe five minutes after that. Exactly. Yeah. So I take that in. So our tribe, that's our definition. And then, okay. So what can we get to resonate with executive management? And that's when I went into the FISA score. And the reason I went into FISA score wasn't to sell FISA scores. Because after I talked about that, I mentioned how we're going to make the FISA score free. Which was the first time I've mentioned that to anybody outside of FR Secure. And I don't think I even made an official announcement to people at FR Secure or Security Studio. I think I just, I'm like, I'm doing it. We're yeah. Gonna, no, I don't think there was any official. <laughs> we're going for it. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. So the reason why, so good, but I felt like I had to do that because I don't sell stuff. I'm not a salesman. Right. I am truly trying to help fix this broken industry. And so here's our definition of information security. Here's something that that uses that exact same definition that we represent with a numerical value. So then I can go to the board of directors and in five minutes, I can tell them, this is your current value. This will be your future value. This is when you'll get to that future value. And this is how much it's going to cost. Right. Yeah. So those four things. So then the executive management knows or the board knows where we're at, where we're going, when we're going to get there, yeah. and how much. Mm -hmm. And they can hold me accountable to that. And I can also hold them accountable because they gave me the the the, edu uh, the risk decisions to enable that to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I talked about FISA score and, and the freeness of it all. You know, a free risk assessment for people that are, you know, freaking out about that, um, which, you know, it's, we've got 1500 FISA scores on the street, right? We, yeah. the goal is 4.8 million. Just a little bit of growth. We, we, got, we got a little bit to go still, <laughs> but there are some people who do make money off of doing <coughs> FISA scores for their clients. Right. We have 15 partners, right? And so I wanted to alleviate some of their concern too, in this talk about what do you mean you're giving away for free? I mean, right. we have a practice built on this. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I, prepare yourself. <laughs> well, part of it's that. And part of it is the FISA score is free, but you have to understand that if I'm assessing myself, that's a non-validated. There's no third party who right. validated and said, yes, that is accurate. Are you, are you saying that people give Why? themselves the benefit of the doubt? I'm going to be a little bit n oh, nicer yeah. about it. For sure. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and some just straight out lie. Yeah. So I talked through that, uh, and then also in the same, you know, talk, it's uh, the third dynamic with our language. So one was within our tribe, one was within our tribe, and what I call normal people, which is this top the topic of the second book that's coming. The third is how do I translate scores or how do I yeah. translate languages? It's not, it's not like German is better than English, which is better than you know French, right? They're they're just different. They're different languages, right? right? So some organizations may not speak FISA score. They may speak ISO. They may right. speak NIST. They may speak COBIT. You know, whatever language they speak, then you need to have a translation between the languages. Right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so what well, we built a translator uh, in Venn Defense, but there are other translators out there as well you right. know, that can translate these languages. Uh, so that's the last. Obviously, it's the easiest would be if two people spoke the same language. So if our company spoke FISA score and company X also spoke FISA score, we'll then just share scores. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. There's no, yeah. no translation required. So I talk about that um, in that presentation. And like I said, I gave the same presentation twice that day. It was interesting because both of them, you know, different audiences. I think both of them were very, uh, I had a lot of people come up and talk to me afterwards. I think um, some people are skeptical because they're so used to being sold stuff. I'll, I'll be honest. You know, when you first mentioned it to me, my first thought was, well, Evan's lost his mind. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the more we talked about it and I, yeah, like, well, giving it away. What? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Like I, it, it does make sense for, for our mission. I think so. Right. And, yeah. Yeah, that's what, yeah, and that's what we do, right? When it should help people realize the commitment to the mission, 
because it, you know the theory has always been you know in business this business that if we stay focused on the mission we'll make money I mean, right we're not going to starve um whereas if we focus on the money we would never accomplish the mission yeah so that's why you know well and you know it's not you know there are other things around it that we can oh tons do so it's not and there's no shortage know, of work to do i mean there's right? you know and you talked about the validation piece and oh, yeah. you know banking and healthcare and you know, for insurance purposes and things like that you have to have right an independent assessment so absolutely well and somebody but, has to fix all this stuff and then right so yeah it makes sense right you can go and where am i at oh <laughs> i've got a lot of work to do and either work towards it and then get that validated or you know well, and the eventual goal bring somebody is for in someday, to help out the eventual goal is for someday for the all for the assessments to be free even the validation that's a function of data mm. If we had good, solid data, which we don't in this industry, about vulnerabilities and threats, you know, on a more, I think, uh, global scale, then we could get predictive. We could do some analytics. Right. So that way I wouldn't have to waste two weeks or a month for an assessment. It, I could almost have an assessment, validate that piece, which would be pretty easy, and then get to work on fixing stuff. Right. Which is really where the value is. Just telling me where I'm at. Yeah, that it opens my eyes and things, but I, I still have to make it better. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then, yeah, the, the, and the work doesn't end. It's not like, Oh God, no. So the things, uh, things that are coming, you know, with all this, you know, we're going to be going on a road show, uh, third, fourth quarter of this year, probably more fourth quarter, um, uh, where we're going to be taking this language to everybody, we, yeah. you know, and, what's that? Oh, no. I'm oh. Good. I, uh, the second part is the community involvement program. So yeah. even FISA score itself shouldn't be owned or managed by a few. It should be owned and managed by the community. So we'll be working on figuring out how to get everybody involved in future development and refinement and right. awesomeness. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we talked about, you know, do you have a, that community, uh, you know, group and you mm -hmm. have to be, you have to be approved to get in somehow, right. right? You have a CISSP, you have a CISM, you have some sort of a certification. We can validate that. Yes, you are at least qualified here. to talk right. about these things. Yeah. And then the community polices mm -hmm. itself. I mean, like yeah. Wikipedia, right? Right. Yeah. There's a ton of, of good kind of those knowledge bases out there that they do it, like, you know, from an IT perspective, you know, Spiceworks comes to mind, right? Yeah. Their, their community is really well self-policed. You can tell who the experts right. are, things like that. Yeah. So it was a really good talk. I mean, they went well twice. Um, the second one was interesting because it was, like I said, it was Secure 360. It was the end of, then I started off, I, I like to insert a lot of humor, you know? And so I was like, you know, when you have this big, party and you're it's coming to an end right and it's time for people to kind of go home um and so you're kind of trying to shoo them out the door All right you know and i'm like and then everybody's head nodding their head i go that's you because <laughs> you're still here at four o'clock and what? whatever. why are you still here yeah so that was fun and then um uh, my last talk was on thursday morning uh keynote at this uh I don't know what you call it. Um, Minnesota Community Colleges, State Colleges, uh, Faculty, okay. Okay. IT Conference. And uh, and I, I had a talk already created that I created last weekend. It was uh, Seven Facts About Unicorns. And then I was on my way driving there in the morning. Uh, and I figured out, I felt like I didn't want to talk about that. So I changed my mind. Hmm. Uh, so I pulled over in a caribou coffee, which is a, you know, for people who aren't around here from around here, that's a coffee chain like Starbucks, but here and, uh, rewrote my presentation on the way to give the presentation. <laughs> it was just <laughs> dumb, but, uh, but the good thing is I had good content already sort of in mind. So whip that thing up and, uh, give talk about 38, uh, cause I've, 
you know, that we, I'm doing this hundred truths right. about information security. And it's funny because I, I'm not getting a, I'm not getting really anybody pushing back on these things. So they must, I'm assuming that people must agree with them. So I'm up, I was on that time, that day I was on day 38. So I covered the 38 truths about information security of a hundred. Uh, and it was really good. It went, it went over really well. I met, uh, and then after that talk was, uh, two present, uh, no, 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 two others, Ryan Manship from Red Team Security. Oh crap. And I can't remember the other, the, the lady's name, but anyway, we were on a panel mm. and, uh, it was a really good panel discussion. Uh, and actually, I might ask Ryan if he wants to uh, be a guest on one of our future podcasts because yeah. I think it'd be interesting to hear. Because, uh, you know, I guess in the traditional sense, they're competitors, but who cares? Yeah. Let's but, work together. That's what There's I was so much talking about do. with, uh, you know, a couple other people at, at, I mean, that were vendors at Secure 360. It's like, you know, let's work. There's, there's no shortage of stuff to do. Right. Right. And, we're going to have expertise that you don't, you're going to, you have expertise that we don't mm-hmm. let's, let's figure out what we can do and help each other that makes it right for, for the Ex- client. Exactly. At the end of the day, what's best for the people we serve. Right. And what's best for the people we serve is for us to be on the same page. Yeah. For us right. to do things in similar ways, similar method. I mean, seriously, there should be no intellectual property in common commodity type testing and, things well, right at I least mean, not even, at a high level right even like pen testing you you are selling the value of your tester and what experience they have but the tools there's only a like there's a limited set of tools right. there's not right and, and some people are developing their own tools fine sure. that's red team type testing and you pay a lot for that right and those things you wouldn't necessarily collaborate on for, right you know if you've but, got something some secret sauce really there but if you have some secret sauce, don't you think attackers have your secret sauce or some right. f- flavor of your secret sauce? And so wouldn't the community benefit by knowing the secret sauces that you have so that right. so we yeah. could plug our you know, plug our holes? So But it was good. It was a good talk. I think uh you know, because Ryan and I had never met before. Um and I think we had some misconceptions about things because you know you it's just natural when you don't talk you know you think uh well i know who you are based on what i saw on the website and whatever right all right so that that was the talks that was the panel that was classes my god it was it was a long week this week isn't going to be as long i don't think well you're on your own list wednesday yeah 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 you're going to celebrate uh your daughter's uh, accomplishment, yeah, which is so really, really cool. There, so, yeah. I'm pumped, man. So that when you have smart kids. I, I, I yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do their homework. Uh, they're like super on it. I'm like, mm, you're, where right. did you get that from? Because that's not what I did. They're raised well. Yeah. Come on. You and your wife do a good job. <laughs> I'll so. give her most of the credit on that. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's part of, part of the skill, man. Being humble. I love it. So, all right, on to news, Uh, some sort of big news. Microsoft had their worm warning this last week. Uh, And it was kind of all over, so you can choose whatever news story you want. It's a a big one. (laughs) Whatever source, right. So, CVE 2019-0708, a vulnerability in the remote desktop services which doesn't require any authentication, doesn't require any user interaction. It's like the perfectly made vulnerability for a worm. Whoops. Yeah. Well, you know, it's crazy how, you know, this thing has been in the wild. I mean, yeah. How this goes back this? to versions, back XP. They're even going to issue a patch for XP. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. Right. So it's like, thank God this hasn't been exploited. Yeah, how did nobody catch it? Right. And it, and we would pretty much know if it was exploited because oh, yeah. worms aren't quiet, right? No. They spread fast. Yeah. If you haven't patched, my God, patch. If yes. you're running XP, uh, retire. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. 
Well, there are some XP systems out there still. I mean, I've run there's into them occasionally. Of, there's some embedded XP as well that's still supported. But yeah, I know there's legacy systems that, you know, businesses just, they, you can't get rid of because. Well, I've seen it know. in public utilities, you know, yeah. an XP controller system and. Yeah, software isn't supported on anything else. Well, and you can't upgrade it because upgrading it would be downtime. And you yeah. didn't build redundancy into the system, so you can't afford downtime because downtime uh, would know. take down an entire you know city's power. Minor and, details. Yeah. But patch, uh, do do be aware. Um, yeah, because it's, it, it's bound to happen. And it's bound to, you know, some certain percentage of people just, I don't know, live under a rock or something. Um, or just aren't paying attention and won't yeah. patch their systems. So there will, I would be really oh, yeah. surprised if there wasn't a worm anyway. Pretty quick. But just to make sure that you're not part of it and it won't affect your systems. So that was the big news. I think the biggest news maybe of last week. One of the uh, others was, I'm a history guy, so I like, you know, sort of reading about things that had happened in the past. And so we had this two years later. Wanna Cry is two years ago already. That's crazy. I know, man. I can't believe it's almost June. I know. What the hell is my life coming to, man? I know. All I do is work. Oh, anyway, sorry. I just I complained a little bit right there. If you want to blow your mind, it's it'll be it, it's been it'll, it's almost three years since I started. Wow, it's been a good three years though. It's been, it went fast. Yeah, it's like holy cow. I'm really grateful. I was just bragging about you and Oscar in particular. Uh, oh, my son was over. Mm. Joe was over at the house uh, yesterday, visited, and um, yeah, I was talking about Oscar and you, and I was like, yeah, just got to make, it's cool. So anyway, I uh, want to cry two years, and uh, I don't know where in particular they get these numbers, but um, I assume that they're somewhat I I mean, I, better than any numbers I have. When you look at like the, probably the showdown. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but according to the, this article I'm reading um, from Circle ID, it's two years later, WannaCry continues to spread to vulnerable devices, nearly 5 million devices affected, which when you put that into context, 5 million isn't a big percentage of systems. On the no. <clears throat> so the fact that yeah. it's still out there and 5 million, the number itself seems large in context with everything else. It's, it's enough to cause a problem, sure. but... Yeah, it's a small number. Uh, but according to the Malwarebytes research, um, Eastern countries are the most at risk. India, 727,000. Indonesia, 561. Hmm. The U.S., 430,000. So we have 430,643 people here in this country that you share the roads with every day. They haven't patched in two years. That are infected with wanna cry. It's like, my God. Uh, how do you find these people? Uh, Russia, 356,000, Malaysia, 335, uh, and so on. So, you know, it's still out there, which is not surprising. I think there's still variants of Melissa. Oh, I'm sure. You know. I'm sure people still get the, like, the I love you or something. <laughs> right? Exactly. Code red. <laughs> yeah. Still bouncing around somewhere. Uh, the next one I have is uh, hacktivist attacks dropped 95% since 2015, which I, I thought interesting. was interesting. It is, yeah. Because in 2015, um, four years ago, they were sort of disruptive, you know. Uh, this is some research by IBM uh, in this article. This is ZDNet, and the title is Hacktivist, the title is Hacktivist, Hacktivist Attacks Dropped by 95% Since 2015. And they're blaming it on two things, the death of Anonymous, the hacktivist mm -hmm. collective itself, um, and the second thing is, what the hell was it? Uh, I don't, remember. oh, increased law enforcement activity, uh, on focused on hacktivists, uh, which is interesting that the law enforcement community itself can focus on anything because there's just so much going on for them. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, are they, hack are they focusing more on hacktivists or more on, you know, dark web stuff and taking down? you know, uh, some of the markets, God knows. I mean, and then dealing with all the BEC stuff, the 
email compromise right. stuff that we see with fraud and ransomware. And it's like, yeah. And yeah. then just your normal run of the mill credit card fraud things, you know, I mean, yeah, law enforcement that uh, they're, they got a lot of work and you know, those guys are busy, really, really good people. Um, yeah. But anyway, hacktivist attacks are dropped, which is, you know, I wonder what, because it wouldn't be hard to start something in the, in today's political Yeah, I almost climate, wonder. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that is interesting. I mean, how hard would it be to... Have they gone? Organize a bunch of people who see the world the way I see the world and just get angry about it and want to attack the other side because we're so divisive. Yeah. Uh, that'd be interesting. Have they gone to, you know... The black hat side, or they maybe, you know, oh, I got a job. Right. Because there's such a shortage and you can't really, you know, it's not worth risking your career to do this because now you've actually got employment doing those things. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. All right. Uh, next article was Bruce Schneier. This is on his blog, Schneier on Security. And uh, interesting how, uh, in March, and we, we heard about this in March, but he wrote about it uh, just last week. Uh, why why are cryptographers being denied entry into the U.S.? And one of the things, uh, Adi Shamir, the S in RSA, uh, was denied entry into the United States to attend the, the RSA conference, yeah. which uh, which was a big deal. Yeah. Uh, you know, for people at RSA, because obviously he is the S in RSA. Plus he was there to, I think on a panel or to give a talk. So he was a featured guest there. Um, and he's Israeli. It's not like Israel is, I, mean, I didn't think Israel was an enemy country or anything. So, and he's been here before. Right. So anyway, anyway, he, Bruce talks about, um, you know, the big, just kind of his thoughts a little bit. And like Bruce's, most of Bruce's posts on his, um, his blog, you know, he only wrote, writes a paragraph right. and then you read the comments because he poses this question and then people comment on the reason. So I think there's more interest in probably reading the comments than there is in the blog post itself. And they usually seem to be pretty, Quality comments too. Yeah, there's always gonna be some. Oh, well, Bruce Schneider is but... such a yeah you know, little G god in our industry. You know what I mean? He's contributed yeah. so much and good stuff. Uh, and the last is the Team Viewer breach. Um, so late last week, I think uh, there was a report revealed. Uh, this is an article from the Hacker News, which isn't a source I use a lot, but I happen to be the one I grabbed. Report reveals TeamViewer was breached by Chinese hackers in 2016. Hey, yeah. When, and the one, I think it kind of goes along that and is a little bit more of a pucker factor is the, the whole antivirus. Uh, you know, so they said, the report is semantic. McAfee and oh, yeah. Trend Micro had Last source week. code compromised for their endpoint protection. So that that'll be uh I, I'm I'm really interested in seeing the details around that, but right. it, it it's probably gonna be a while before we Yeah, and it's hear interesting how that. that didn't grab as much press as I would have expected. Yeah. But there's maybe another shoe to drop on that. Yeah. So maybe that'll be one that I'm, we I'm cover next week. Maybe it'll be some more news. Cause that's a that's a that's a potentially a huge deal. Oh big time, big time. Right. Source code, uh, the arguably the three largest, um, you know, anti malware. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Ugh. All right. So that does it for this week. Last week, crazy week. Hopefully, you know, listeners got some some uh, benefit out of listening. I will be posting. Uh, I'll create a series of blog posts this week on each one of the talks that I gave, so I can share my slides and. You know, if anybody wants to reuse or whatever, you know, feel free to take it. But watch my um, my my site, evanfrancine.com, and you can grab those slides and 
get kind of a synopsis, a lot of the stuff we talked about. Uh, that's the meat of the show. What's your week look like this week, Brad? Anything? I don't know. I haven't looked at my calendar. No. It's the same with me. I just know <laughs> I have Denver in there somewhere. No, it should be good. I've got, I've got some time blocked off for, for working on things or you know, nice. incident response stuff. So Cool. Yeah, and I'm behind like usual, so I'll, get, <laughs> I'll try to get something cut out. <laughs> Uh, all right. Other than that, uh, thank you, Brad. Don't forget, you can follow me or Brad on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Evan Francine, E-V-A-N-F-R-A-N-C-E-N. And Brad is at Brad Nye, B-R-A-D-N-I-G-H. Email us at the, at the show, unsecurity at protonmail.com, uh, unsecurity at protonmail.com. Uh, love to hear your thoughts and comments. That's a wrap. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unsecurity Podcast. We value our listeners and would love to hear from you. Give us your feedback by emailing us at unsecurity at protonmail.com. That's U-N-S-E-C-U-R-I-T-Y at P-R-O-T-O-N-M-A-I-L dot com. Be sure to tune in next week to hear the latest insights from Brad and Evan.